Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We're your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. Welcome back, Weirdos. On this week's episode of History for Weirdos, we have a very special episode. We are going to be interviewing John Collins Black. Let me tell you a little bit about him. John is a lover of games, puzzles, challenges, and adventures. He has also hunted for hidden treasures. Inspired by his love of childhood fantasy mythical quests, an idea came to him to create a national treasure hunt so magical it might captivate the imagination of millions. John spent nearly five years of his life acquiring this treasure and securing it into its hidden locations and writing the book, There's Treasure Inside. He hopes you enjoy discovering it. And we are going to talk to him about that hidden treasure today. Yes, guys, we are so excited. John, when your publicist first pitched us, uh, pitched, yeah, us, you, we were so incredibly excited. We're like, we have to get this guy on here immediately. And here you are. Here I am. That's that was a great intro. Thank you. Oh yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> and we're I'm, happy I'm, to have I'm very you. excited to be here, actually. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a perfect fit because the idea of treasure hunting, in and of itself, feels very historical and very nostalgic. It is. Yeah. So, what got you interested in treasure hunting to begin with? Um, oh boy. I mean, I, I think I, in, in different ways, I hunted for treasure since I was a kid. Mm. You know, some of my earliest memories are like digging in the red clay dirt in North Carolina, looking for (laughs) quartz crystals, you know, and then only finding like smoky quartz and being like, this isn't very cool. And then keep digging for something more with more sparkle and shine. You know, I think that I always had a sense of adventure and just wanted to be out in nature. And, uh, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Did you like learn about a treasure hunter or something that made you like formalize that sense of adventure that you have? Uh, when we, we, there was a kind of a Genesis experience of mm-hmm. treasure hunting that was like behind, kind of led up uh, in some ways to the treasure hunt that I've created. Uh, back cool. in 2016, early 2016, late 2015, uh, I was out here in LA and I was in the music industry and, and mm-hmm. I loved uh, making and uh, performing music, but I got burnt out. <laughs> 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 and I was needing to um, to shift gears. And so... I'd always had this idea, like, if I could clone myself, uh-huh. like, it'd be cool. There was, like, so many different things I would like to do. Like, if I had 15 different versions of myself, maybe, yes. like, I could be a monk <laughs> yes. or a paleontologist oh, yeah. or a race car driver. Because I actually grew up close to where NASCAR started. But, like, so I had these different ideas of, like, things I would love to be. And then one of them was, like, treasure hunter. And I was like, well, I've got some free time on my hands. Oh my God. What would this look like? So I actually started doing research on, because when I, back then when I thought of treasure, I thought of like, like sunken treasure, like mm-hmm. shipwreck treasure, yeah, mm-hmm. like Jacques Cousteau, you know, like getting yes. a boat and a crew and some son, you know, special sonic equipment and going out and searching for treasure. And so I started actually doing research <laughs> on this. <laughs> and about a week or two into it, I was like, this is going to be a huge undertaking. Like, it's not simple to go look for a shipwreck treasure. So I think in a moment of, of doubt, I did a search for like hidden treasure in mm-hmm. the United States. Mm-hmm. And all these articles came up of this treasure uh, uh, that had been hidden by the gentleman in uh, Santa Fe, or he was from Santa Fe. His name was Forrest Finn. Oh, no, I'm not Have familiar with that story. Are you yeah, he basically right had hidden about half a million dollars of gold in a treasure box somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. Oh. And I was like, okay, so there's a treasure that's a lot more accessible. Yeah. And I might, you know, like I know it exists. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anyone's found it because there's all these forums of people talking about it, but no one's found it. And I'd love to go out into nature and actually, you know, see if I can, like, find this thing. And so I actually spent several months of my own life on the search uh, for that treasure. And I think that being just having the experience of of going out into nature or trying to solve clues, uh, because he wrote a poem 
That's he just had one poem, and uh, trying to solve the clues in the poem and going out and finding that treasure was was really just exciting. I mean, like, I like lit something in my belly, mm-hmm. and uh, that stayed with me. So then. COVID happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You guys remember that, right? Oh, Oh, yeah. Unfortunately. So there was 2020 and we were all stuck in our homes with too much time on our hands. And so I was in a unique situation because I was like, what do I want to do next? Mm -hmm. Um, And I got this idea of, well, you could do, you could create your own treasure hunt. And I was in a unique situation because I had experience hunting for treasure. So I knew that there was like just something magical about that that I thought would appeal to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But I also had the means, you know, I, I, I was in a unique fin- financial situation in my life where I had the means to actually create something that was going to be really, really large and dynamic. And I didn't have to worry about, you know, doing something and making a profit. Right, know? right. right. Hiding a treasure is not going to make a profit. <laughs> um, just the opposite. And, yeah. then, um, and then I had some extra time on my hand to really figure out how I was going to do this. And I was really naive because I thought it was going to take me like a year. Mm-hmm. And it took me close to five. So, Oh, my God. So during that five years, what were you doing? Like, how were you going about <laughs> acquiring this treasure or all yeah, these so various pieces? So that was pieces? kind of the first thing, right? It's like, what do I actually want to acquire? Yes. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know where to start. You know, Forrest basically had mostly just gold in his. And when I thought, like, first thought of, like, treasure, it was like, okay, you know, gold and what else? But then over time, I started getting better ideas okay. and I I wanted to really create something that would appeal to a a wide variety of people Mm -hmm. and ages, you know, like, yes, gold in a box. That's great. Like some people like pirate treasure kind of thing. Like that sounds great. But what if we could make it more accessible to different people, different interests? So I wound up getting things like physical Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people are like, what's that? But it's it's a digital keys on a physical coin, um, <laughs> rare Pokemon cards. Yes. Oh, nice. Um, I uh, got uh, a lot of historical items from people that uh, either made or owned by people like George Washington and Picasso and Amelia Earhart and Henry David Thoreau and Andrew Carnegie and, wow. oh my and God. Uh, Jackie Onassis. And so I just wanted to have a, like a wide range of different objects. A little something for everyone. Yeah. To try to spark different interests. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was about trying to get people to participate. You know, that's really what I wanted to do was to get people out of their homes, away from their TVs and cell phones and out into nature. Mm-hmm. That's honestly such an amazing I mission. Think, mission. Yeah, yeah, it's a great mission statement beyond just the treasure itself. Mm-hmm. And speaking of the treasure, it seems like a lot of these are very historical pieces. It's not just like you said, like your normal gold bars, right? Yeah. Which right. there is one I've seen. More but than there's, one, yeah. I, there are, I mean, I can tell you some of my favorite pieces I've seen okay. were the Hellenistic pieces, of course, mm-hmm. right? I'm a oh, huge yeah. ancient history guy. So I saw there uh-huh. were two, not rings, but bracelets. It looked like that yep. were from the fourth century BC. Very plausible that they could have been worn by someone who knew Alexander the Great. Yeah. So I have uh, those two uh goat bracelets yeah and then i have a snake bracelet and then i have a a gold uh crown wreath yes i saw the crown wreath yeah and all those were were, (laughs) all those were from or around the time of alexander the great so as you probably know when he conquered all those lands Mm -hmm. in less than 13 years everything from macedonia to india they brought tons of gold back Mm -hmm. to Greece. And then they really started using that gold to create jewelry, which was kind of like jewelry slash artwork. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really kind of a status symbol. Of course. You know, there's a, there's a lot of actual, probably uh, R-rated symbolism (laughs) around those goat goat bracelets. I don't know (laughs) what age your listeners are, but Unsurprising with the Greeks. Yeah, Unsurprising. really. Unsurprising. <laughs> what is your favorite piece of all of them? What was the hardest one to let go of? Yeah, that's really hard to say. Really? I mean, I, I wish I, I I get that question a lot. Yeah. And, and there were there were all of the, I mean, I everyone everything I got I thought was really awesome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I wanted it to be something that I, not only I thought would resonate to mo- a lot of other people, but that I would be really proud of. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to pick one. Um, I have a, a 96 carat emerald. Wow. Um, you actually see it on the cover of my book, a picture of it there. But uh, um, 
that was really special to hold. Yeah. Um, the the stuff from ancient Greece was was really special. Um, there's a diamond and sapphire brooch that was owned by Jackie Onassis when she was in the White House. Oh my goodness! And that was my dad's favorite. He was like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> oh, did your dad want it? Maybe. Are you sure you want to put that in the treasure box? I got a lot of that from my family who saw a lot of the items. They were like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> yeah, because it's so incredible. Like you said, I imagine to hold those pieces. Yeah. How much willpower do you need to put them away and then hide them where no one can find them? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of willpower, indeed. How do you? Start going about finding something like the Jackie Onassis pin. Yeah. Do you start with like, I know I want this pin yeah. or how does it unfold? That's a great question. Um, you know, I would. You, yeah, I, I started putting a list together and then I started talking to uh, different people who are experts in different fields. So I was very fortunate. Um, I know a gentleman who uh, Rob Lubinsky, who's the largest rare mineral dealer um, in the United States and, and one of the largest in the world. And so I knew I could maybe source some really cool uh, gems mm -hmm. and uh, raw minerals from him, like sapphires, rubies, emeralds, and diamonds and things like that. Um, and things that were just different than what you would normally find. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I asked him, do you know other experts that in other fields of collectibles? Yeah. You know, Cause I, I didn't have, I, I'm not someone who collect a lot of stuff. Okay. You know, I was just a dad, a stay-at-home dad with two kids writing children's books when, when I started putting this together. So um, I didn't, like, have this network. So I, I just basically started networking through people, asking, well, who do you know? And then, and then getting ideas from them and then kind of the, the kind of scope uh, happened mm -hmm. from there. And then sometimes I would just do – try to do searches online to see if there was any cool things. And I, I would keep up with different auction houses and I had all these different spreadsheets and, like – Oh, my god! And then a lot of it was just kind of like serendipity. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I would be like, I want this. And then somehow the next day it would somehow appear somewhere. Manifesting. Yeah, it, there truly. Was, yeah, there was definitely yeah. found at some point that there was like powers greater than myself who were kind of at work helping me yes. along. Because one thing that w actually went faster looking back on it um, than I would have ever expected was actually how quickly I was able to acquire everything. Like. Really? I was able to do it most everything in less than a year. Oh, that's so surprising. I thought when you said it took five years that it was five no, years that of was, looking for stuff. that was just chapter one, finding stuff. <laughs> oh, so the, the other four years were about actually finding the places to hide the stuff. Partly, but I also kind of did it maybe more back, like kind of backwards than what you would actually think because mm -hmm. I had all these ideas of things that I wanted and then I acquired all this stuff and had all this stuff and then I was like – Wow, like I really need to start the research process. Oh, and that wow. was the thing. Because mm -hmm. unlike the two of you, I am not like, I'm not a historian. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not we're historians, not historians either. either. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I've listened to your work. I think you are. But um, yeah, so then I was like, oh boy, uh, this is going to be like hard. Yeah. Because I have like there were 65 to 70 unique objects that each had uh, either their own story or like stories around them, historical stories mm -hmm. around them. Yeah. And so I hired five researchers and we spent uh, the better part of a year uh, researching everything we could about every item that I had. And basically, then they sent all that information to me, and I started reading the best of the best uh, of the stories, and I was literally just blown away by the history. Yeah. And there were things that, like, I just would never have imagined, things that I was like, I acquired this without knowing what I acquired, mm -hmm. but it's so cool, or much more cool than I even thought. <laughs> um, and so that was really kind of informed the narrative of the book. Mm -hmm. The book is really a, a lot of the histories of the objects. Okay. Well, we love to hear that. Yeah. yeah. So I think when you read the book, you'll enjoy the history because it's a lot of history in there. And uh, woven into the histories, you've left clues, correct? Exactly. For the actual treasure hunt itself? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know there's four sections, right, of where you're more, I think, deliberate in your clues to to the four treasure chests. But there's one, like the ultra treasure chest. From yeah, this, yeah. I'm putting my own words to this. Yeah, yeah. From I like that. The ultra, <laughs> the ultra treasure chest. <laughs> I played That's a lot how of. I respond to it like uh, now from from yes. now on. Out. I played a lot of video games as a kid. <laughs> um, but the ultra treasure chest that has clues throughout the entire book. You yeah. have to be really paying attention. Yep. Yeah. So there, there are five treasures, and uh, the reason that there, in case you want to know, the reason that there's five treasures and mm-hmm. not one is mm-hmm. that I wanted to make them accessible. Mm. You know, amazing. like when, in my experience with the the treasure I was looking for, we knew it was in the Rocky Mountains. It was like a forested area. Mm-hmm. But looking back on it, not everyone would have had the opportunity to go to the Rocky Get, Mountains, yeah. right? Financially or just how far away it is. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to be able to spread them out so that people would. Would think there may there might be something accessible to me, um, and I was like, "Oh, that's a great idea! Five treasures instead of one." And but the execution of that was like way more difficult <laughs> to yeah. hide five treasures. Um, and also, when I uh, was like, "Like, how am I going to keep this from just being chaotic?" Uh-huh. So mm-hmm. uh, I have four treasures that are, are, are of a similar size, mm-hmm. treasure boxes, and then I have one larger one, which, as you mentioned, has a lion's share of the treasure. And I have four chapters at the end of the book dedicated to each of those four uh, other treasures. And then, yes, there's clues can be anywhere in the book related to the largest one. Did you have any help from your research assistants or from your family creating the clues? Or was that all? I did it all myself. Wow. And I did that because I didn't want anyone I know to have the responsibility of knowing, uh-huh. you know, in case though, you know, was any people who got too exuberant or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, or I didn't want uh, anyone else to have that responsibility. So yeah, it was that part was left up to me, and my my wife was disappointed because she loves <laughs> putting together clues. Uh-huh. You know, we love puzzles and games and escape rooms, mm-hmm. and like we oh, do at home escape rooms. Where we've made, you know. Uh, Tr- like small treasure hunts at our house for parties and things like that. Oh, I love um, that. So she would have loved to have been involved, but when when I explained to her the reasoning, it made sense. So yeah, if yeah. you ever hide a treasure, you have to tell me all the clues. I will not. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you for a second. Yeah, no, I, I think you have much better willpower yeah. than I do. She, yeah. I would crack would under tell her me. pressure. Yeah, <laughs> she'd use her like therapist mind games on me. Yeah, and then I'd be like, okay, that's totally what it is. That's totally not just that I'm weak willed when it comes yeah. to you. <laughs> Well, of the stories that you found when you were doing the research on these items, were there any that stood out to you as like really cool stories? Um, yeah, I mean, they're all cool. Like, they they were they were really like a cool history, but at the same time, um, there were a lot of like inspirational stories. Mm. I have a couple of gold medals in the treasure. Wow. Uh, boxes and uh, so cool. one was from uh, the 1996 uh, Atlantic Games. Oh, this nice. is one of the first um, items I acquired. Like in my, one of the very very first, and I was kind of naive. I got it from an auction, okay, and oh, I didn't okay. really even like read the details of it that closely. I was just like, I remember the from a, as a child watching those games and thinking they were so cool, and uh, it was actually um, the gold medal from the Nigerian soccer team. Oh, and wow. so they won the gold medal that year in Atlanta, but their story is absolutely insane. Like, I, it should be a movie. Really? Because yeah. it was like uh, they came over here with no money, uh, had to pay with their trip with their own credit cards. Oh, my God. Got their wow. rental cards, like, repoed. Um, were kicked out of their ho- – like, had to wash their own clothes at the hotel because it was during the AIDS e- epidemic. And they were like, "You're from Africa, so we you can't we can't actually allow you to wash your clothes in the hotel washing machines." Wow. And they had to wash their own clothes and dry them on the yard. Like it oh was just God. their trip was total chaos. And plus, they weren't a very good team. Uh-huh. They had yeah. never won anything. They weren't expected to do anything, and then they actually wound up like winning the whole thing. So it was an it's an amazingly like great inspirational story. That is so cool. We actually have recently we did a, an episode on Jim Thorpe, and he had a similar Olympic experience where, like, the odds were stacked against him, and he won. Yeah. It's interesting how that happened. He won with literal garbage shoes, like shoes he found in the garbage. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But, I mean, also, when you think of Nigeria, you don't think of, like, a soccer powerhouse. Yeah, that's true. So it's – I mean – I mean, you don't think of the United States either, but like the fact that they probably beat out Brazil, like Portugal, yeah, they actually beat Brazil. Yeah. I mean, that's unbelievable. And Argentina. And they – 
the interesting thing about uh, Nigeria is, is they're a land of like hundreds of tribes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the very idea of having a national team is not quite what it is in a lot of countries. Yeah. And, and there's not every year. I don't want to like like cast with a large net, but there have been you know historical like conflicts amongst mm -hmm. the teams because they come from competing tribes. Yep. Oh <laughs> so this whole idea of like national team is is not necessarily as cohesive uh, for them as it is for other teams. But it's an amazing story, an amazing like kind of, it, it just reminds me of one of those Disney sports movies, you yeah. know, where right. the underdogs like overcome all the obstacles, except it, all, it really happened. So it's really cool. <laughs> I love that. I know. And it seems like this is just one story yeah. out of so many potential stories that are in like through all of your treasures. Right. right. I mean, I can't even imagine if you were to like put together all of them, like that would just be yeah. probably mind blowing. Was there one that was harder to find than the others? Or did you tend to come about them with ease? Because you said it took you all the year. objects. Yeah. And that's kind of funny. There is. Um, so I, uh, there's an interview that was done. I talk about this. Uh, Screen Rant did an interview uh -huh. uh, about the influence of Dungeons and Dragons had on my treasure hunt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we saw that. Yeah. saw that. So the very first idea of, of treasure in my head was like, you know, this idea of, of – a dr dragon's hoard. Okay, yeah. You know, and in a dragon's hoard, you have yeah. gold coins, you have mm -hmm. rubies, rubies, yeah. emeralds, and you have uh, something like a gold chalice. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And so I'm like, I want a gold chalice. <laughs> <laughs> I want a gold chalice, and uh, and I was like, that's gonna be easy. You know, there's got to be you know a bunch gold of them everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go to auction houses, and yeah. then I'm gonna find this gold chalice. And it was hard. It was hard to find a gold chalice, like something really authentic. Like okay. there's like lots of knockoffs, but I wanted something really real, really mm -hmm. authentic. And uh, it took me uh, a long, long time, but I found a really cool one. What's the story of the gold chalice? Where is it from? So it's actually from uh, South America, from the Chavan cu culture. And uh, a lot of people don't know that culture because it was the first highland culture in the Andes Mountains. So okay. they existed at like 10,000 feet altitude. Wow. About um, 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were actually a religious cult. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> they were a religious cult, and they built a temple that um, – is it was this labyrinth, and they would bring people through this labyrinth, and it was uh, they would give them hallucinog hallucinogens to drink, and uh, they had such strong spiritual experiences, quote unquote, that it like kind of held this like um, influence over the culture for like a thousand years. Wow! And uh, so we don't know if this chalice was uh, brought as an offering because mm -hmm. th these people would travel for hundreds of mi miles uh, to these high elevations to offer um, sacrifices or gifts to the the temple mm -hmm. uh, masters. Mm -hmm. uh, or it may have been, you know, what they drank the hallucinogens out of. We don't know, but that's yeah, so cool. It was that's really cool. so wild. Has there been any carbon dating on this chalice? Uh, not that I know of. Not that I know of. I just know that it was. Uh, uh, like the kind of the historical provenance came from the auction house with it. And how interesting that it's um, such a spiritual piece. I wonder, have you noticed this may be a little like woo woo, but do the different pieces of the treasure have different energies to you? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Like everything has like, it's, it's interesting. Like it's almost like you can feel mm -hmm. like a little bit of where they came from with most of the pieces, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or maybe I just make my imagination makes that up, but it certainly feels that way. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. What does the Jackie Onassis pin feel like? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like... Uh, it feels fashionable. Yeah, <laughs> I, of I know course. that. Like, like it's like, it feels like it can be worn like casual or really fancy. Like it's mm -hmm. like you know, it's interesting because she had such a like a, a fashion influence. Yeah, worldwide. Um, but yeah, it definitely feels like something that's just really like you could wear it. Fifty years ago, or you can wear it today. That's, you know, so that's cool. really cool. I love those timeless pieces. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Uh, on the flip side, do you have any? of the artifacts or any of the treasures that have like more of a, maybe like a negative or like a whole oh. bit of a haunting feeling to them. Oh. There's one that comes to mind that could. Oh. Which one is that? The <laughs> Spanish oblong uh, gold. 
like the gold piece or the. You mean gold. the shipwreck piece? Yes. The gold disc or the the or bar? the gold like I think they called it an oblong and and but it's like the gold bar, but it's like old Spanish one. It's not like a modern Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That one. So there's a gold disc. Okay. It's okay. round, uh -huh. and then there's a gold bar that's shaped like. Gotcha. Okay, I think I'm talking about like, the bar, but either one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I could see that. Like, I wouldn't say that like in person, but it, those both of those have like crustaceans on them. Really? Oh, man. Okay, you can still so see cool. the crustaceans from when they were they were under the uh, water for like 241 years. Oh my god. That's like almost as long as we've been a country. Yeah. And what's interesting Roughly. about that bar that you mentioned, and I didn't know this again, I did not know this when I acquired it. Uh -huh. um, so that shipwreck was found in, in 1993. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and then to kind of commemorate that shipwreck, they made 245 box sets. Wow. And in those box sets, they had like a certificate, and then they had a gold coin from the shipwreck, and then they had a a, a silver bar that was gilded silver, so to make it look gold. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was modeled after that bar. No so there way. were dozens and dozens of disc and bars recovered in that shipwreck, but apparently they thought that this one was the most beautiful okay. of all of them. And so they modeled all of those box set uh, bars off of, of the bar that I acquired. Oh, that's so cool. And at the time of writing, there was actually one on eBay you could buy at an auction. <laughs> I don't know if it's still there or not, but yeah. We got to go check. Yeah, we got to go check. <laughs> Do Does anyone in your life plan on going on this treasure hunt, by the way? My sister. Really? Yeah, which just shocked me. Really? Why, Why is that? Because... My, I love my sister to death. Uh, we're a lot alike in some ways, but like she's, I just never saw, she's pretty like dry in some, some ways. Like uh -huh. <laughs> I would say cynical, but I just never, like she loves the hike and stuff, but I've never seen her like would have thought she would have been interested in like searching for a treasure. But uh, she showed interest right away. I think she That's was so the, cool. Yeah. So yeah, my sister, we'll see what happens. Is she your older sister or younger, younger. sister? Okay. So it's the little sister energy of like, I want to show my brother that She's I really can figure smart it though, out. so I, I I wouldn't put it past her. Yeah. That would be wild. I would probably get some criticism if she finds it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I will say, I don't know if you remember this. I, I don't know, because I'm a little older than the two of you, but like when I was a kid, we mm -hmm. had like the cereal box competitions yes. or like stuff yes. you could win. And there was always this fine print mm -hmm. or like the McDonald's puzzles you try to Put, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Right. Forget yeah. what they were called. Anyway, so they all have this small print said that like employees and friends and family yes, can't couldn't participate. Yeah. And I remember when I was a kid, I was always like, well, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm glad I'm not like a friend and family like, <laughs> or employee. Like, why don't they get to participate? So, like, my family was like, you know, we can't participate, right? And I was like, yeah, sure you can because I don't want you to be, you know, why not? Right. You didn't put a disclaimer on the book. I did not. And if anyone <laughs> complains about that, I'll be like, well, I just think it's fair. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you didn't tell your wife, you probably didn't tell your younger sister. No, I didn't tell my younger sister anything. Yeah. yeah. How about your kids? Are they interested in this treasure hunting side of you? So I write about this in my, actually, the first chapter of the book um, because my, especially my son who's six now, he was three when I started writing the book. Oh my gosh. Um, he's always like wanted to search for treasure. So he's always like digging under the couch cushion, <laughs> hiding like, I remember that he would hide like plastic gems and like Play Doh and then dig them back up. Yep. And he would go on treasure hunts in the yard. But I never mentioned what I was doing to either one of my kids. And it wasn't until like just in the last month or so when they started seeing some videos online mm -hmm. and they're like, Dad, is is that you? Did oh you really gosh. hide the treasure? Where did you hide it? How did you find all those things? And they started interrogating me, you know, but like I didn't want, I didn't really make it a big deal. But it was interesting to watch my son have like this kind of just innate yeah. desire to like, And I think a lot of kids have that, right? We come yes. in and we have this sense of adventure and it's unbridled and then right. we get older and we lose it. I think it's. Every kid's dream to find a hidden treasure. I don't know any child that didn't go on treasure hunts yeah, at right. some point. I even I looked agree. for treasure in my parents' room as a kid. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I'd find my mom's like jewelry in her jewelry box and be like, here it is, the treasure. So it's almost like you get to bring out your inner child by going on this treasure hunt. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what I would challenge. I mean, I would encourage people to do is like to allow your inner child to come out because that's what this is really all about. 
Do you expect folks to do this on their own or with friends in a group? I know people will, some people will do this on their own. I think it's better if you do it with someone else because, mm. right. you know, I searched, uh, when I was searching uh, for treasure, I did it by myself and I also, uh, for a time, and, and then uh, Kimberly, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time, mm -hmm. uh, joined me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed having someone with me because just being out in nature, being able to explore with someone, uh, I think it's more fun. Um, I think two heads are better than one when you're trying yeah. to yeah. solve a puzzle. Uh, but I also think on a safety, uh, mm. on a safety issue, it's better. Uh, all the treasures are hidden in, in safe places, and okay. people shouldn't do anything uh, silly to to you know try to go places that aren't safe and do things that are unsafe. But like at the same time, it's always good to have someone with you. Yes, especially mm -hmm. if you're in a place where maybe the cell service isn't good or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always good to have someone there. You know, just for for safety reasons. I heard that safety was important for you when writing this book, reminding folks to be safe, that you it didn't is. put this on the side of a cliff or anything. Did my PR right. people tell you that? No, when I was researching. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I think on the website, right? I mentioned yeah. that, right? Yeah. It is. It's a, it's, it's a big deal, you know, because I do know that uh, people will, some people will get excited about this. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you can get carried away. I mean, I've had times in my life where I got too excited and got carried away and did something silly. Right. But, you know, it's one thing, there's sometimes you can do that without consequences and sometimes mm -hmm. you can do that with consequences. So yeah, I think uh, safety is huge. I have a whole postscript in my book where I just talk about like safety yeah. and like, these are the things that you should not do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> please do not do these things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are no clues in or hidden meanings in this part. And this is just me to the reader. Please, you know, the, follow these guidelines and you'll, you'll, you'll have a fun experience. Yeah. For the love of God, don't do anything stupid. Yeah. <laughs> to sum it up, I'm guessing. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about your criteria when you were scouting these places. I, mm. I'm curious, without getting into too many details, of course. <laughs> But how did you come up with the places that you wanted to oh, hide the treasures? This is going to be tricky, right? Because people are listening to every word yes. I say now. That's true. Um, I don't know where the camera is, but yeah. I would say that, okay, I wanted them to be spread out. I have uh, traveled um, in one capacity or other to every, almost every state in the country. So I do oh, have cool. some working knowledge of like the land of America. Mm -hmm. um, I... Basically, my process for what I can, what I really probably can tell you about it was mm -hmm. that I that I knew I knew from my experience searching mm -hmm. that once you're on the ground, the world is a lot bigger. So, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, if you guys so like true. Google Maps, yes. oh, I love it. Yeah. But if you ever look at a place on Google Maps, even if you zoom all the way in and you feel like that you know all all of the area as well as you can, mm -hmm. and then you go to that place and you're on the ground looking at it. It's a whole different can of worms, yes. right? It's a whole different ballgame. So I, I had that knowledge. So I, I didn't want to just go to a region without uh, very specific kind of areas to like do reconnaissance in. Mm -hmm. But I also knew there was no way I was going to sit on my computer and pick a spot. Okay. Okay. Um, I, yeah. uh, and and, and none, of, none of the treasures are hidden on private property, okay? Mm -hmm. So okay. it wasn't like, oh, Uncle Joe's house. I know where that's at. I was, <laughs> that's not, you know, that wasn't going to happen. So I, um, my game plan basically was to try to narrow it down uh, to a region uh, and then go do reconnaissance maybe in the four to six places. Okay. And then I would land and then I would have four to six places that I'd want to look around or hike to. Mm -hmm. and do reconnaissance. And then, I, you know, it, until you're on the ground, at least in my experience, maybe if you do a treasure hunt, you'll have a different experience. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, um, I had, until I was on the ground, I, I, I wouldn't know if, a good, uh, if an area that I picked was a good workable place. Yeah. And depending on how many people were there, like, that was another thing. I had to avoid people. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah. And then I had to do a lot of hiking. Mm -hmm. And then I had to try to figure out if like what the what the best options were from what I found. And so I would have that was kind of a narrowing down process. You must have gotten a lot of steps in. Oh yeah. Many, many miles. <laughs> and that was one of the thing with like five treasure boxes versus yes. one. Yes. Right. You made more work for yourself. Like yeah. <laughs> exponentially more work. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're wearing like your Apple Watch, so it was at least counting your steps. Yeah. Those no. days. <laughs> no. I, I'm, I, I don't have an Apple Watch. But. <laughs> yeah, I think I hiked, I don't know, it was like, I don't know, what was the total? 
It was a lot. It was a lot of miles. I can imagine. I told you before we started recording, Andrew and I are tempted to drop everything and go on this treasure hunt ourselves. I don't even think tempted. I think we're going to. (laughs) (laughs) I think you should. Yeah, I think so too. And we noticed we're looking at the different regions um, on the map. Yeah. Ours is the biggest. California. But we are right next to another one too. So I I think they – I think we should clarify for the listener what you're referring to. Yes, definitely. Because I I released a a video. There was like a promotional video kind of introducing this to the public um, um, where there's a graphic of five different regions. Yes. Okay. So that's just a graphic. Okay. So that's not real. Or it's Yeah. You're getting an exclusive – information oh. i've never had an opportunity to tell people this so, it's just a graphic so this Let's is go. just a graphic that the person who was editing it made for visual representation oh, so that is that makes not so much sense. it's not like those are the regions and e- there's a treasure box in each region oh. i didn't i didn't give people that much information so i don't want people to you know at least at least the people listening to your podcast will, yeah. will realize that that's not actually information you can use. That's very helpful. Yeah, yeah that is. Yeah, okay. cuz we so the definitely region, saw the region it. might be larger. <laughs> <laughs> Way bigger. It might be more difficult. <laughs> That's even better honestly, just throwing people for a loop. How long do you think it'll take folks to find the treasures? Have you thought about that? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think searchers are going to have a lot of different opinions about this. I don't want the treasure hunt to last forever, but I also uh, would be more disappointed if it ended very quickly. Right. Um, you know, the Forest Fin Treasure took around 10 years to find. So if it took 10 years to find all five boxes, I wouldn't have a problem with that. If it takes less, I won't have a problem with that. I don't want it to extend way out into the future. I didn't mm-hmm. do this for a legacy project where like we're in... You know, 2145, and people are like, <laughs> the lost treasure of John Collins has yet to be found. Did it ever really exist? Yeah. Um, but I do think there are, is, is some excitement that's generated by something not being found so fast. Yes. It has a little bit of more like mystery. Mm-hmm. At some point, it goes from being a hidden treasure to more of a lost treasure. And in some mm-hmm. ways, the kind of a lost treasure is kind of a cool, yeah, cooler thing, right? So I, um, you know, it could be that um, one or two of the boxes is found more quickly, which I'd be fine with, mm-hmm. um, especially if it was one of, not the largest box. Um, but, yeah, we'll see how it plays out. It's one of these weird things where, like, we don't know until we know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I will say that uh, if it seems to be more difficult, I always have the opportunity to, to have more clues given in the future. Mm. You know, if it's found too fast, then... That's right. You can't do that. Right. So I'm not, I don't want to discourage anyone because at the end of the day, I don't really know. Maybe it's really easy. Right. Your you're only frame of reference. I, I Yeah. I, there's no way to know. Yeah. You couldn't run it by anybody. Can't run it by anyone. Can't A-B test it. Can't do any of that. So This is really interesting. Okay. I know. I'm really That's excited. That's kind of an exciting part <laughs> for me. It's like I'm giving birth to this child and I don't know how it's going to grow up, you know, and, yes. and I get to watch it. That's for a, a second, metaphor. I actually forgot we were recording and I was going to be like, okay, so let's, let's start coordinating this. <laughs> let's start planning right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, because we're totally going to do this, are there any best practices that you recommend for folks when, like, because I am not an outdoorsy person. I'm an insidey person. Yeah. So, <laughs> Reading those history books. Yeah. yeah. So if you are new to treasure hunting, are there any, like, tips that you have for folks, like things that you should have? things you shouldn't have. You mean in trying to fi- solve the clues or when you go out to search? When you go out to search, even if it were a different treasure. I would suggest trying to have a, well, let's see. Um, that's a good question. I haven't been asked that question before. From my own experience, I would say, well, again, I don't know. There's different personalities that might mm-hmm. treat it different ways. For me, I wanted to have a good idea of kind of where I wanted to search. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, and I was very methodical about my searches. And I'm not saying you have to be that way. I think I just got like really like intensely focused on it. So I would like have an area and I kind of grid search. Oh, that's smart. Um, you know, and um, and one of the things I'll share with you, I haven't had a chance again to share this because I'm just starting to like do interviews. But mm-hmm. there's this terminology I think a lot of people I notice when I'm having conversations, start people start saying, you know, using the word buried. 
Oh. As in like, you know, it's like you need a shovel and it's yeah, buried, buried underground. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't bury any of the treasures <laughs> underground. I, I don't want people going on public land. And digging and up. And digging yeah. up, you know, like, that's especially true. if you're like on a state or a national park, that's a good yes. way to get in trouble. Yes. <laughs> you know, to take a shovel and start digging around. Um, so don't bring a shovel. You yeah. Don't need so one. like, you know, yeah, it's not, it's, uh, you know, they, they may be hidden, but they're not buried. So like, you know, if. You want to get analytical, you could like do a grid search, mm-hmm. like, you know, because that way you know you don't, you're covering every little nook and cranny of that particular area. Um, take plenty of water. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, if you're only going to search, well, it, 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 yeah, it depends. How um, long you plan on being out there? Yeah, I mm-hmm. would, don't search when, it, when there's snow on the ground. Mm. You're not going to find the boxes. And this is a good way to like, you know, people to get too enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to go out in the winter time and search when it's cold and there's snow or ice on the ground. It's like, no, that's a good way to like, you know, hurt yourself or get yeah, too slip, cold or like, you know, right. you know, yeah, there's no need to do that. Um, that's a good tip. Being from I mean, LA, I forgot about snow. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I didn't even think about it. You're right. <laughs> but specifically, like you asked that question, like specifically, is there something on mind that you? No, I was just like, what do you take with you? I guess on a treasure hunting adventure, because yeah. snacks we... and water, snacks, snacks and water. water. There you go. Not... We recently rewatched all of the Lord of the Rings movies. There you go. Just whatever, like. And Frodo it, had. Yeah, <laughs> yes. they had like nothing. I kept thinking that the whole time. I'm like, they don't. Right, have, they didn't even have backpacks. In there. They don't have backpacks. They don't have water canteens. They just ate off the land. Yeah, yeah they had like the elvish bread. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> the elvish bread that's supposed to fill your stomach. Yeah, we could take that. We'll take that. Yeah, but yeah, you don't need a metal detector. I'm no. guessing. No. I mean, a metal I don't detector. think. I, I don't. Yeah, that's a good idea. I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think you need a metal detector. I, okay. I didn't put it someplace where you need a metal detector. Okay. I mean, that there are people I'm sure are going to use metal detectors. <laughs> but it's sure. not necessary. <laughs> but, but I, I, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't think you need one. And there are probably some areas like national parks where you're not allowed to walk around with a metal detector. Yeah. Um, so make sure you're allowed if you're going to have one, but I don't think it's necessary. So wherever you go, consider like doing a grid, have water, snacks, and know the rules. Yes. Be right. safe. Yeah. yeah, don't dig holes in national parks. Don't please. dig holes in anywhere. You don't need to. <laughs> really? <yeah. laughs> anywhere you don't need to. That's actually, that's a fair distinction. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I think that that about wraps it up so far, right? Yeah, unless there's anything we didn't ask that you think would be interesting for folks to know. Um, no, I'm just happy to answer the questions that you have. Awesome. Well, tell us when is your book available? It's going to be out October 21st. Well, congratulations. So just right around the corner. I know. I think we're going to get it the day it comes out. Yeah, you could pre-order it. I saw on Yeah, your you could pre-order it uh, through your local bookstores. There's a link on uh, the website, treasureinside.com. You can pre-order it on Amazon. Um, yeah, and I would in- encourage you to get it sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Definitely getting it October 21st. There's Treasure Inside yeah. by John Collins Black. You guys excited? Oh, I'm so oh, excited. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're excited to, I am excited to see how people start to... I'm excited things. just to see other people get excited. Yeah. I was talking to your producer, Travis, before, and like he was like, oh, that's your book. And I thought he knew what I was coming here oh, for. He, yeah. he didn't. And so when I told him what it was, he was like, his eyes got as big as saucers. And he I'm was like, so excited <laughs> when we walked is, up. See, yeah. that's what I enjoy. That's that's the reason I did that. So. And this is actually a, a random, non-treasure-related question, but I remember you mentioned that you were writing children's books. Yeah. Is this your first book, or have you written and published before? So I have a, ch- on a children a, a, a Co-founded a children's book company called Marble Press. Oh, cool. Okay, and so it's a traditional children's book company. Uh, we have lots of artists and illustrators. It's it's really great material. Um, I also authored a children's book um, that our editor at uh, my my uh, partner mm-hmm. submitted my manuscript to our editor anonymously, so he would not feel pressured, and he fell oh. he fell in love with my manuscript, and so. That book just came out in the spring. So I have two oh books gosh. that actually came out this oh, year. No but it's not like uh, the my children's book comp- company is not for me to to make books. It's you know for us to find great yeah. books from everywhere. But I guess I do have a children's book that came out in the spring. What's the book called? It's called uh, Our Unbreakable Thread. Oh, nice. It's basically an ode from father to son. Oh. About like the invisible thread that kind of binds the generations together. So it's kind of like a, a Father's Day book. 
Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's a perfect And this is probably more for adults and parents as it is for kids. Yes. Well, congratulations Thank then you. on two books in one year. Oh, and, and I did, since they were coming out the same year, I did put a clue in my children's book. <laughs> oh, there we go. So Ooh. there so is at least folks. one clue in the children's book. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, we can go get the children's book today, this tonight. That's even. true. It's already available. Perfect. And wow. is there anywhere that folks should connect with you if they want to? Like, are you on social media or should they just visit yeah, your website? Yeah, we, I have a, a Twitter profile on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a Facebook and then if you want to message uh, uh, me or my team directly, mm-hmm. um, you can do that on my website, which is treasureinside.com. Awesome. Okay. okay. Well, weirdos, there you have it. John Collins Black with There's Treasure Inside coming out October 21st this thank year. Thank you so much for being here and for answering our questions. Thank yeah. you. This has been fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.